so most of you guys know me already from the Integration Monday um, session, so I'm not going to spend too much time um, talking about who I am. Um, let me, sorry, can I just double check we've got the recording going as well? Um, sorry about this, just bear with me for a minute. Yeah, awesome. So the recording's gone. So um, I think a few a few people have probably seen my new little initiative that I wanted to do a dirty plug for. So I'm running a new training course called Zero to Cloud in One Day with a zero. And the idea here is, um, you know, it's kind of working with customers and people in, in a training workshop where we start with nothing, we build a dev environment, set up loads of good practices like automated build and deploy, things like that. And we go through building an application and at the end of the day is hooked into Azure, um, uses Azure AD for security and multi-factor authentication and, and a few other bits and pieces along the way. So that's my kind of new thing that I just wanted to make people aware about. But on to the more important stuff now. Um, so with um, my slides, what's going on? <laughs> I forgot this slide had an animation in it. So this slide was... Um, in quotes, borrowed from the um, Integrate Summit. So it, at that summit, we had um, Bill talking about why modern integration was um, was important, and we had this idea that applications are, are sort of communicating in different ways today to what we typically um, typically used to. We've got different levels of scale, different types of messaging patterns. We've got SaaS applications, and we've got this this whole scale of event and telemetry to think about. So being able to do messaging at, at um, scale much bigger than what most projects are used to was part of the part of the new wave of Microsoft integration tech. And within that whole ecosystem, Service Bus is potentially one of the core sort of at the heart pieces of that of that stack. Now, if you haven't come across Service Bus before, there's three main areas to Service Bus, and some people might argue there's four because there was a notification hubs feature. Um, that was that's kind of in service bus in the in the portal, but I think um, I've decided that I'm not going to talk about that because one, it's not really an area I've worked on, and two, all of the kind of market and promotion material around Azure seems to be pushing that more towards the mobile space than talking about it as being a service bus thing. So, although that's part of the service bus feature stack, I think it's something I'm going to stay away from today. Um, the three key areas I'm going to talk about are relay messaging. So relay messaging is really about connection between two applications, which is bridged through the cloud. We've got um, service bus messaging. So we've, if you imagine the concept of a cloud-hosted message broker, and we can push messages onto queues, we can pull messages from queues. And then we've got Event Hub, which is a high-performing stream-based event system. So those are the three key areas that we're going to talk about today. And my approach for doing this is to do a quick lap around each one, show a couple of demos, show a couple of example use cases for them, and then we'll move on to the biz talk bit a bit later on. So if you're um, new to Service Bus, then we have this idea of a multi-tenanted Service Bus environment where in the cloud you can create a namespace, which would be your container for your Service Bus artifacts. and each namespace can potentially belong in a different region. Within that namespace, you can have different types of messaging, um, messaging artifacts. So you can either have queues and topics, you can have relays, you can have event hubs. And I guess one bit with this diagram is that you can you can actually have relays, queues, and event hubs all in the same namespace. It's not that that a namespace is dedicated to just one type of service bus. Now. Dan talked a little bit at the London Summit about the scale factor of, of Service Bus and the kind of things his team um, what we're having to sort of think about on a daily basis with customers, and he, and he sort of threw up this idea there about how much how much traffic do you need, and kind of you know we had some post summit conversations as well where Dan was challenging us to talk about what we thought big was in terms of messaging and how many messages per day, and. Uh, Many customers that you come across talk, you know, they talk about potentially thousands, hundreds of thousands of messages, and then 
some bigger customers talk about millions of messages per day. So if you think about, um, you know, the last couple of big biz talk summits in Res, uh, Redmond, we had the big um, HCA um, biz talk implementation where they were talking about 60 million messages a day and how much of a big deal that was for biz talk and how they had to, you know, tune it like it's never been tuned before and all, and all that kind of stuff. And really, um, if you start thinking about Service Bus by comparison, so the team at Microsoft who look after Service Bus have got, you know, given me two stats to talk about. So Event Hubs processes 30 billion events per day, and Messaging processes 7 billion messages per day. They, they, they were stats as of about a month ago. So um, when you go comparing them like for like, really the, the HCA use case which we in biz talk terms, we were looking at thinking that was, you know, that was the biggest biz talk thing anyone had ever done. But compared to what Microsoft are dealing with in terms of service bus, that's just it's tiny. It's almost insignificant by comparison. Um, you know, I guess, you know, by comparison, um, service bus team have probably handled 60 million messages by the time they all get to work in the morning from waking up. You know. Um, so really, when we start thinking about this colossal sort of internet scale of messaging, Service Bus just gives us something different to what BizTalk could offer. And, you know, being able to handle, you know, phenomenal amounts of messages in BizTalk on its own is going to be really expensive. But with Service Bus, it can be a, a lot different scenario. So if we start thinking about um, the individual features now, so if we take Service Bus Relay as the first one, Service Bus Relay is a firewall-friendly bridge to expose a WCF or REST service via the cloud. So whenever I try to explain this to people, I always say, well, you know, you're familiar with web services, you're familiar with things like a hardware router. So one of the companies I've worked with recently, they have an F5 hardware router that they load balance traffic over HTTP across a couple of web servers. And everybody gets that. It's stuff we're used to for, for years now. Imagine that you could take that F5 hosted in the cloud and suddenly your route is outside of your organization but still able to route across those web servers. And that's really a bit like what the service bus relay is. So we've got this endpoint that we host in the cloud. The difference is that our on-premise service has made an outbound connection to register with the, um, with the service bus relay endpoint. But at a conceptual level, we send a message to that to that endpoint in the cloud and it'll forward it just like a router would to an on-premise service. Now that gives us a lot of um, a lot of opportunities in this hybrid integration space to be able to connect from the cloud or from one organization into another organization without having to do a lot of the complex infrastructure solutions that we we typically do in the past. You know, there's no there's no more um, having to set up VPNs if you don't want to. There's no more getting one team of IT pros to talk to another team of IT pros and you know spending thousands of pounds before you actually can do a connection from end to end. So the target scenarios for Service Bus Relay are typically you'd be exposing something like a WCF service from your on uh, your on premise state. You'd expose it through the cloud and somebody would consume it. Key benefits are that it's simple to do and it's a really low cost so you can do a lot of messaging and just pay pennies for it. Um, key constraints here are that you need to use the WCF relay bindings, which not all applications would support out of the box. And you could also have a, a little bit of a limited uh, management story on Azure. So if you go into the portal for the relay, you, you only really see that your endpoints registered and listening. There's not a lot more to it than that. So let's let's take a couple of um, a couple of example scenarios now. So I've, I've shown this slide to a few people in the past, and this was one of my um, one of my example projects that I worked on a few years ago, where I worked with a customer in Denmark, and they had IBM WebSphere, and there was one of their partners was building an application in, in another data center, and they needed to join the two together and, and be able to consume services from WebSphere from this other application, and um, you know, typically this would be something like a VPN. Um, they heard about some work we've been doing with Relay in the UK, so they asked us to come over and, and talk about it and see if we could um, set something up. So, cutting a long story short, we went in and, and one day we had 
service bus relay set up with the WCF routing service and we were able to stick that in front of WebSphere kind of like that and basically join the whole thing up so we could consume services from WebSphere um, without having to do any real hard work. You know, it was just spin up the WCF routing service, listen on the relay and the partner application could consume that service on the relay endpoint. So it's kind of a bit, bit like that. Now, another project I've been working on quite recently, which was pretty cool, was um, working with a customer um, who's doing some SAP integration. And we've got a, um, a what's called a SharePoint provider hosted application where it's, it's kind of like a custom extension that you write as an MVC application for SharePoint. Excuse me. And we wanted to host that in Azure as a web app, but we wanted to be able to talk to our SAP instance on premise. So what we're able to do is we hosted an API in Azure and using Service Bus Relay, we're able to reach down to an on-premise listener and then we're able to forward messages into this evolving microsystem, uh, microservices architecture we have on-premise. So what we were able to do was create some lightweight services for um, you know, just basically WCF and REST style services where we've um, got them on-prem, they're able to wrap up a little bit of integration with um, SAP and what we found was that in no time at all, so we were talking like two days, we had the architecture up and running and we're able to make a call through from the provider hosted application to get data out of SAP. And one of the cool things we did here was we were also using um, this product I've, I've just put on the slide here called um, Link to SAP, which is from Theobald Software. So for the SAP integration bit, we're able to you know take a BAPI that was in SAP, drag it into the designer, write some dots, that code to call it and wrap that up inside our service and once we had this in place this architecture that took no time to set up we um, were finding that the, the developers and the team were able to take a Barbie that one of the SAP team guys had written and within two hours they were able to have that deployed um, built end-to-end -end, deployed to our test environments and the, um, the application they were developing for SharePoint was able to consume that Barbie via the integration stack so that's a real you know, a real powerful story there from the perspective of, you know, two-speed IT, quick, you know, getting quick um, value from that SAP service without spending weeks and months building an integration architecture underneath. We're getting quick feedback. We know what the data looks like and we're, we, you know, we're delivering value very quickly. But also the, um, the architecture itself, so in addition to being really fast, there was no significant infrastructure set up. You know, it didn't take us... Um, you know, weeks to get um, IT pros to build any special machines or to, you know, create any VPNs or anything. Um, we also um, found that the, the costs itself were peanuts. Um, you know, the, the relay costs were like pennies per thousands of messages. And a really good question from Dan Toomey there was, um, could you have used hybrid connection for this? So great question, Dan. And, and actually, in the, the same customer, we had another part of our architecture which originally had a very similar thing where <clears throat> on premise they had um, I think it was a WCF service and in the cloud they had an API but they had hybrid connection between the two and um, what we found was that um, basically they were spending about £60 a month for hybrid connection and we um, we could flip that over to Service Bus Relay, and that was you know they were paying like sixty pound a month per environment, um, and I think that was the developer edition if I remember right, something like that. And so they've got like a minimal SLA, um, so they really could have done with scaling it up to get a better SLA off it. So you're talking like you know best part of thousand pound plus a year by the time you've scaled up, and we could flip over to Service Bus Relay between those two components, and we got the cost down to like hundred pound a year. So it was a you know really significant saving um, for the you know for, for just by changing that architecture, even though they're kind of the same under the hood. Plus, um, Service Bus Relay was just a bit um, a bit easier for us because we don't we didn't need this agent to manage. We've just got our you know our listening component that registers, and it, you know we've got a bit more of a management story than what I think we had with um, Hybrid. So um, yeah, and Dan. As well, you know, good point about the the MABs prerequisites. So, 
also you've got that um, SQL Azure database you need for maps that we ended up having there that wasn't doing anything. And I think as well with the, the whole maps, um, what is the roadmap for that? And, and obviously the roadmap nowadays is that it's, it's kind of not really going anywhere. And I don't think there's been a clear statement for hybrid connections about where it fits. So for us, I think it was a safe move to move to Relay, but it actually saved us money and, and just kind of opened things up a little bit to do you know, to do more with it. Um, Paul, in terms of real money, I've got some slides later on that I'll talk through some of that and um, give you a couple of examples. So jumping back to the slides then, um, the, so I guess the next thing is um, some more example scenarios. So just wanted to call out some case studies. The one at the bottom at Northumbria University, that was the one I was involved in. Um, the FDC case study was the, the Denmark one I mentioned earlier, but also many of the Microsoft API apps which are coming on-premise to do stuff use Relay under the hood. So I think Service Bus Relay is a really safe, reliable technology to use that, you know, it's heavily used by customers, but also Microsoft internally. If we take a quick look at a demo now, so I want to show you how easy it is to, um, to do this this whole piece of hybrid connectivity with Service Bus Relay. So sort of in hybrid integration in a day, we're going to do hybrid integration in five minutes. So here I've got my um, my um, on-premise service. It's a, a really naughty WCF service called Backend Service One. Maybe not the best name. Um, in in my Visual Studio, um, which I'll drag over now. So I've got a sample application here where it's really simple, you know, it's just a, a .NET application with a console app that's going to call through to that backend service one. So I've got a service reference here and a little bit of login code so you'd see something in the, in the ugly console window I'm going to show you in a minute. But the key thing is we're going to do a call for get data. Now, the problem I've got is that the the backend service one's running on a VM, which is in Amsterdam, if I remember right, and the console app's on my desktop, so the, the two wouldn't natively have connectivity to each other. So in, um, if I just check my listeners on, so in uh, Service Bus Explorer, which is the tool they use if you're doing any work with Service Bus, you can see here, um, if I just do a quick refresh, so under the relay section, I've got my WCF routing service. That's a registered endpoint on um, on the relay. So all I did to set that up was um, in this folder here. So in IES, I've created a virtual directory called router that points to this folder here. Without writing a single line of code, basically I've created a bin directory with a service bus DLL. I've created a, um, an SVC file. And if we have a quick look at that, um, so you can see there's not really anything in here with the exception of the service points to the WCF routing service endpoint. And then the magic's really in the config file. So in the config file, I've created a WCF service here, which is using the basic HTTP relay binding. And a little bit of config for the binder, but further down, I've set up the, you know, the credential for being able to <clears throat> being able to access the service bus relay. And then, if anybody's not familiar with the WCF routing service, basically what you do is define a section down here in your config file in the system .service model area, where you say, sorry, I'm just going to get a quick drink. <clears throat> where you kind of say, if I get a message that comes in with this SOAP action, then I want to forward it to this WCF endpoint here. And that's the WCF endpoint that um, is a, it's a client for calling onto that backend service. So the little twist here with that one is I've got a, the contracts um, wild carded so I can kind of flow any message to it. So with that, um, with that, bit of um, stuff in the web.config. I've now got this, this component sitting in front of my backend service, 
which listens on the um, service bus relay and can accept a message and forward it to my backend service. So if I now, um, just to show you that running, if I now run my console application, and you can see here if I um, click a message, the first call, typical WCF style, it's a little bit longer, but then after that my calls are pretty, you know, pretty quick there. So we're talking like just under 100 milliseconds to call through end to end. So that's actually pretty, you know, pretty good response times. And um, you know, as I say, you know, the cost of service bus is one of the key benefits of that. But that shows you there that we took an existing service, sat WCF routing service in front of it. The relay automatically, because it's got the, the right credentials, it creates the endpoint when it comes online, and we're able to call through end to end. So that was, you know, hybrid integration in five minutes or so there. Okay, so next, um, let's talk a little bit about um, service bus messaging. <clears throat> so service bus messaging is very much like any typical kind of um, messaging broker, so a bit more powerful than MSMQ, but it's really more of a compete to RabbitMQ, I guess. Um, the key difference is rather than managing the servers yourselves, you'd have this option of a cloud-hosted messaging platform. So if you think when we're talking about, you know, if you think of the customer scenarios earlier where we're thinking about customers who might process a million, 10 million messages a day, if you're thinking about um, processing millions of messages a day and you're doing a RabbitMQ implementation, you're probably going to spend a lot of time thinking about how do I configure my message broker, my RabbitMQ instances, to be able to deal with that volume of messaging. You know, that's probably going to be a very big administration requirement, lots of setup, lots of tuning, where if you're using Service Bus and you're going to go to, to big scale messaging, Microsoft are kind of already sort of handling a lot of that for you, and you're just creating some namespaces on a platform that you know is already capable of doing 3 billion messages a day. So the, um, the target scenarios for Service Bus messaging is firstly asynchronous messaging, durable messaging and publish subscribe, they're, the, they're probably the three key ones. The key benefits are that again it's very simple to set up, it's pretty low cost and you can do high volume as well, but you need to be able to support one of the protocols that you can use, so if you're in the AMQP space or the REST space then you can talk to you to a service bus queue topic. Um, there's also the SB messaging assembly, or so, so SB messaging um, sort of Microsoft internal protocol that they use. Now, just a quick note while I remember, um, Dan asked me to mention that they've just released a new um, preview version of the Service Bus SDK, which I think is version 3.0, so that's just gone on to NuGet recently, and there's a few um, a few quite big changes into how they've sort of built that SDK and some of the features it has, so if you're doing stuff with Service Bus, it might be worth having a look at that. Um, but hopefully when we have Dan on um, in a few weeks' time, he'll talk about that a little bit more. I think that literally just came out over the weekend. Now, with Service Bus, um, Service Bus Messaging, a couple of examples of what people have done with it here. So some examples from the uh, website are um, Scanska. We do, we're a construction company, and they've been using Service Bus to do monitoring in buildings of, of different things. So I think the idea was they used to have people who would go to buildings, do some safety checks, and then you know they'd find unless someone happened to be at that at that building, um, you know, they, they would miss a lot of a lot of things that they should really sort out. So one of the things that they did was they put um, devices in these buildings to monitor for things going wrong that were able to use service bus to call back to a central system and feed some data about what's going on in the buildings and kind of give them extra scope for covering who you know covering these various sites. A similar scenario was um, I think it's pronounced Koros, who apparently are the ultimate connected car manufacturer in China. And I guess their idea is that by connecting a car to the internet they can stream messages through through service bus and um, back to their internal systems. Another example was Metrobank in the UK. So the Metrobank um, have Dynamics CRM online, 
and SharePoint, and they've used Service Bus Messaging to have um, near real-time messaging between these two systems, syncing stuff up in the background. And the final one, which I've talked about in the past, was when I worked at Boober, we had this um, global API where we did uh, we use Service Bus to do pub sub across different businesses in different countries. So the idea was you could send a message to a central API and then it would route to our local branch in Denmark or the UK or you know other countries depending on various routing rules. So there's some pretty um, pretty sort of interesting scenarios there and if we look at um, I guess the core sort of use cases for um, service bus message and the first one just for anybody who's not familiar with queues uh, yeah quick question from Shazia yes um, the slides will be going on the website um, probably tomorrow with a video so the sender um, if you're new to service bus messaging sorry the, one of the queue concepts is that you've got this durable sort of messaging which is based on a first in first out pattern a sender could send a message to a queue disconnect go and do something else and at some point, either now or in the future, a receiver could come and collect that message and do something with it. The other key scenario is um, a topic where a sender can send a message to a topic and some routing rules can define that one or more subscriptions may receive a copy of that message. And then each subscription can have different people re receive copies of the message. And you might have one receiver who comes along in five minutes and gets a message and the receiver might get it at some time in the future. So topics are quite interesting when you start looking at things like um, scatter gather patterns, publish subscribe, some kind of routing where you want if a message is about oranges it goes to one receiver and if it's about apples it goes to somebody else. You can do other patterns, I guess I've just mentioned these a little bit. Um, one of the ones that many people aren't quite so familiar with is you can actually do an RPC style pattern with queues and topics. So the idea was um, you can send a message to a queue, you can specify a response queue as a property of the message that you send and the idea is that the receiver would do something with a message and they would give put a message, um, a response message on the response queue and use something like a correlation ID or a session ID to, to um, tell the receiver of that response message what it relates to. So let's have a look at a simple uh, messaging demo now. So I'm going to have a quick look at my other Visual Studio instance here. Drag that across. And this, this demo is pretty simple, really just aimed for people who haven't seen this before. Um, but I've got a, in Service Bus Explorer here, I've got a queue called Test Queue, and nothing too fancy about it. The, you can see here there's a whole bunch of different properties, and you've got things like um, dead letter supports. So if your message can't be delivered, you can get it to dead letter onto a dead letter queue so it doesn't disappear. You can have partitioning, and I've got a link later in the deck to a slide, uh, to a previous integration Monday where Dan talked about some of these lower level features in quite a lot of detail, so I'm not going to go too much into them today, but I would definitely recommend if you're interested in learning more about Service Bus, that's a great session to go and you know dig a bit deeper. Um, but the key thing here is I've got my queue, and in my um, Visual Studio um, solution here, I've got two applications. One's both console apps again, so I'm sorry there's, there's no fancy Minecraft stuff this time. I um, really just want to show how easy it is to send a message to a queue and collect it back. So here we've got um, my service bus um, connection string. So there's you know, not loads of stuff in the config file. We've just got a simple connection string to service bus. I've got a, um, a reference to the service bus NuGet package up here. And then if I want to send a message to a queue, I use the queue client dot create from connection string, tell it which queue, and then I can create a service bus message and send it. Nice and simple, two like two, three lines of code there. On the receive side, so there's a few different ways that, that you can do it, but one of the most common ones is to use this um, what normally gets called the on message pump. 
So again, I can create my queue client up here and I can specify some options for receiving messages. So the key thing is that um, we have um, what's called a competing consumer pattern. So if you imagine you want to, you know, you've got a queue, you want to receive messages and in some scenarios you might want a single threaded receiver if you want genuine order delivery first in first out type stuff. But if you want to scale it to higher throughput, you probably want to have multiple receivers at the same time. So you can have multiple processes receiving a message, but you can also have multiple threads receiving messages within a process as well. Now, what you can do with the on message options is that you can specify how many concurrent receivers you want. So in this case here, this process could receive five messages concurrently and I've chosen not to auto complete, which means um, I'll have to explicitly tell the message when it's when it's completed, when I'm finished handling it. So that's quite an interesting um, approach there because if I if I auto complete, I can process messages a bit faster, but I run the risk of something like um, losing a, a message potentially if my if my process doing something with it um, throws an error. So when my on message event fires, then I can basically um, get the body of the message, do something with it, so I'm just right into the console window, and then I can choose to complete it, which will remove it from the, queue, from the queue, or I can abandon it, which will release that message back to the queue, and somebody else could collect it. Now, one of the really interesting things about service bus messaging here is this ability to kind of um, have, have the SDK handle all the serialization and stuff for you. So in the example here, what I've done is um, when I send the message, so I've, you know, I've got this loop going around and all I'm doing is I'm taking this .NET type called test message and I'm passing it into the broken message and that means that internally that broken message object is going to handle the serialization of my custom .NET type when it goes on the queue. Um, likewise, the, the other side, um, when I do the get body and I pass in the type of, you know, the reason I've got this messages um, project here is I've just got a shared assembly that both projects reference. So that means I can easily um, have it deserialize that message and take it off now. What you might want to think about in the real world is that that kind of communication of what type of message have I given you is a bit more difficult than just having a shared .NET type. So if you've got, um, if you're in control of the sender and the receiver, then it probably works the way I've just shown you here. But if you're getting the message from somebody else, then you probably want to work more with um, just native JSON as, as the message body. You may want to specify things like what type of um, message it is. So if I remember right, I'll uh, let me check this for a minute. I think we've got, um, a few properties here, so we've probably got um, content type. Um, what, so if you imagine we said this message is JSON, another message was XML. So what, when I've done this in the past, supporting the content type means the receiver can look at that value and work out how to deserialize the message. And the the other thing you might want to think about is how do you how do you tell it what type of message a message is? So you know, if, you, if you're in the JSON world or the XML world, it's, it's a little bit different. So XML, you might have a namespace and a root element which tells you what the message is in a very biz talk type fashion and you can work out what to do with it. But if you're in a JSON world, there's not really a great way of communicating what that data is. It's just, it's just a scrap of text with curly brackets. So in the past, one of the things we've done is um, we've included in the label a description of what the message is so that you know how to how to deserialize it to a .NET type at the other side. So you might say this, this is a customer message, this is a you know product message or something like that. But if you if you're in the real world, I think that's one of the key design considerations you need to think about. So after waffling on a little bit there, um, let's have a quick look at this demo now. Which um, oh, great, what we got? <laughs> so you didn't didn't make enough sacrifices to the demo gremlins there earlier. So um, sorry, if I can just run that again. I'm 
not sure what that was all about, but uh, so here's the two console applications. So click a button to press any message, and you can see we're able to get our messages through pretty quickly there. They're receiving pretty fast off um, service bus queues. Now, if I wanted to take this demo a bit further, I could do some, have multiple receivers um, on the same queue. I could do pub sub across multiple topics, but the key thing from this demo is really just to illustrate that it's pretty simple to send a message to a queue. It's also pretty simple to receive a message from a queue as well. And um, you know, any time you really think about service bus messaging, you should be able to get up and running pretty quickly. I guess one of the design choices you would make is if you're receiving, what would you host your process in? So maybe you'd want to do a Windows service or something like that, or maybe you'd want to look at some of the um, some of the open source projects that are out there that can give you some ways of dealing with that. I think. Um, one of the one of the kind of I guess not a word of warning, but I've never really seen many people to do much with the WCF um, service bus binding. I, I can't remember what it's called now, but um, we we once had a bit of a play with that, and I, I wasn't really that big a fan of it. So if you're going to try that out, I'd just be just be a little bit cautious that I think I've never really seen many people use it. So I'm not sure how great it is. Okay, um, so if we jump back to the slides now, let's talk about um, talk about event hubs. So event hubs sound similar to service bus messaging, and I think there's a, a question from um, I'm not sure how to pronounce um, your name. Sorry, I think it's Mace Um So. I'll come to your question just at the end of the event hubs topic, but hopefully I'll answer it as we go. Where event hubs and and um, service bus messaging seem very similar at a at a glance, and I've got an article where I go um, on my blog where I go into quite a bit of detail about what the differences are, and hopefully, um, <laughs> so apparently your name is pronounced like magic. Great, so you're now called magic. <laughs> um, so the, the, the look very similar and the reason for that is because it's all about sending a message over AMQP and the actual sort of semantics of a message look very similar but the way things happen behind the scenes is quite fundamentally different so the event hub is really about a massive scale event stream whereas the service bus messaging is about first in first out push your message onto a queue pop it off a queue and the key difference about that is um, if you want to go to the extra level of scale, so if you think about 7 billion versus 30 billion, that's a lot of messages. And to be able to get that extra sort of volume of scale to support different scenarios, there's a few semantics about how you would do the message in that Microsoft needed, needed to be different. So the, if you imagine that these two things are just aimed at different use cases, but there's but there's a lot of similarities about them. And the key difference is that when you um, when you work with an event hub, you don't have this concept of peak lock delete of a message that you do with um, service bus messaging. So the idea is that I want to have reliable delivery. So and, and you know potentially um, once you know guaranteed once delivery or something like that, where a receiver can go on, grab a copy of a message do something with it, delete it if it's um, happy, and release it back for somebody else to process, but that message um, will only be taken off when somebody's successfully received it. Now, with an event stream, what's different is that, firstly, Microsoft support partitioning it out to a lot of partitions or even sections of the stream, but also by removing the, the idea of peak lock delete and just having a reader across the stream, then you can go to a different level of scale because you're not locking things or anything like that. So hopefully I'll, in the slides time I'll show you a bit more of an illustration of that. But the target scenarios for an event hub are really about um, Internet of Things, event, event broadcasting scenarios, and application telemetry data. With event hub you get the option of massive scale at low cost. And the key difference from messaging was that you can read this stream many times. So if we take an example where in service bus messaging, I get a message, I delete it from the queue, I have an error, that message is gone. 
with a vent hub, the difference is that I've got a pointer to a stream, and that stream may be kept for a period of time that I would configure. So if I if I started reading the stream today, and then got halfway through, I could rewind back up that stream and reread some messages. So I've got this option of message replay support. With event hubs, um, one of the you know many of the key use cases for it involve combining it with other solutions on Azure. So maybe you combine event hubs and stream analytics would be one example. And I guess um, other things are event hubs offers AMQP, HTTP, and SDK-based support for receiving and sending. Um, if you're receiving messages, so I'm going to show this in a, in a few slides time, there's something called the event processor host, which is a little um, NuGet package Microsoft offer, which is it's the best way if you want to receive messages yourself to be able to, to kind of get them off without having to do all the hard coding yourself. So if we think about um, this idea that event hubs is involved in many solutions that Microsoft offer, and some of them people are aware of, some of them people might not be as familiar with. Um, sorry, I'm just shutting the window because there's a bit of noise outside. Um, if we take the Internet of Things offering, so if we look at this subsystem and we have this idea of event uh, producers, collection of events, transformation, storage, and presentation, and at the heart of it, Event Hub was this, this piece that lets it deal with the phenomenal scale of many devices, millions of devices feeding millions of messages really quickly. And almost Event Hub kind of load levels that, catches it somewhere safely that different things can read that stream and do different stuff with it. So if we had telemetry coming in from, from a whole bunch of internet connected cars, for example, we might have stream analytics jobs that do different kinds of stuff and aggregate that data into you know how many cars are on the road now, how many cars have been on the road in the last couple of days. We might have other other jobs that just bulk copy it into something like Stream Insight. And it's all based off this ability to read this same stream in multiple different ways. So a couple of use cases then. Um, one of the ones I found quite interesting was um, so application insights and API management on Azure. Under the hood, they both now have um, Event Hub support in them. So App Insights is kind of taken in all these telemetry events to an Event Hub, and then it, it processes them internally into its various data formats for presentation of what's going on in App Insights, which I think is pretty cool. Um, if you've been following API management, you'll have seen recently that they've um, been talking about some event hub support on that, so that would be an interesting one to keep an eye on. Um, there's a company called Autolib who use event hub as part of the um, IoT stack to exchange information between devices and vehicles. So this is all about, um, if I remember right, I think it's in Paris, there's a car sharing scheme, and by feeding telemetry from cars, people are able to use um, devices to work out where there's a free hire car or it's like a loan car where the idea is if rather than having thousands of people with their own car that they only use a little bit, let's all share a, a pool of cars that we can just go and find one that's free. So that's quite an interesting use case as well. Um, one of the ones I've been doing with Northumbria University that's quite cool is um, we created um, log for net um, appender for event hub. So that, that's been out there on my blog for a while and the idea was that if um, we have any logging going on one of the options is we can stream that login data just like any other telemetry from any of our applications up to an event hub and then we can choose to do some stuff with it so I talked about this a little bit I think in a previous session um, we'll come on to that a bit more in the in the demo and in a moment but just taking a step back to earlier when we talked about this event stream and the idea was um, if we imagine we've got um, all these senders streaming telemetry data in, the key thing was that this stream of messages that queues up doesn't have any messages deleted off it when we collect them. They only get removed from the queue once it goes past their retention period. So I could potentially have you know, 30, 40 days with, I think it's 30 might be the maximum actually, so up to 30 days of historical messages. And then... The idea is my consumer group can just start somewhere in that stream 
So imagine I started here and then I just read on to here. I get to the end and then I'll just get in real time on here, real time, get each new message that comes onto the stream. But what I might do is I might go back and start here and reread this bit here and catch to the front again. So I've got a lot of different ways I can kind of do stuff with those messages. So if we t if we think about this um, example at the university, then so what I had was um, we've got the service gateway API style component in the cloud. We had service bus relay which went on premise to WCF routing service, and um, we had sub micro services that were involved, and we had we've got some BizTalk stuff that's in our stack as well. And the idea is that as we integrate into systems. Um, these systems will feed telemetry out to that event hub, which will be part of our kind of BI stack in a way. And stuff will feed from the from the event hub into um, into things like stream analytics, machine learning, and eventually will display the data in Power BI. So if you imagine that would be the typical message flow of a system. And as the message went through the system, the telemetry data from our log for net implementation would go up to the event hub and then we can we can choose to do something with it and what we what we'd sort of plan to do is that from day one we just wanted the event data to be there and we'd we just kind of ignore it and then over time we'd build some bi capability on top of that to do something useful with that data so a couple of um couple of sorry just bear with me a second a uh, couple of demos here then so the first one is um, just really a, an introduction of how to use event hub so nice quick one again and hopefully you'll see again it's it's quite similar to the service bus messaging one so here we've got um, a console application again we've just got nothing more than a a connection string but we've also got a, an event hub name this time as well which I guess is a bit like the queue name we had before so using the event hub client I can create an instance of that client for the connection string and then down here I can do a client dot send and send a special object called an event data which I guess is kind of the equivalent of the broken message in the queue example but this time um, the event data doesn't really take care of my um, serializing my message, so I'm just using JSON.NET to convert it to to um, a byte array. I think it ends up being, and we just pop that on the hub. On the receiver side, so this is where I was saying it. Excuse me, it's a bit more complicated than um, a bit more complicated than the service bus queues ones. So we've got. Um, I think if I remember right, I'm just going to display this out on the console window. So we've got um, an event hub name, but also we've got a storage account now. And what I've done is um, I've added a, the new get package, which is called Service Bus um, Event Processor Host. And what this does that's pretty cool is it comes online and it creates a listener for, well, depending on how you configure it, there's a couple of different ways, but the way I've done it is it creates a listener for all the different partitions in my event hub instance and in the um, in the storage account it'll basically create a blob for each of those partitions where it'll manage it'll manage the um, kind of index of where it is in the stream so it's going to be concurrently reading all these different partitions and to show how that spins up so I've got my settings from the config here My, that'll come online and start listening for messages. When a message is received or an event's received, it's going to fire into this event down here, and that's going to basically let me do something with it. So I'm going to iterate through the loop of events, and all I'm going to do is write them out of the console window. Nice and easy, not, nothing too fancy about that. Um, further up, I've got a couple of options around the checkpoint, and so this is kind of where it managers at, at what point do I save how far I've got through the stream so the idea is if if the process blew up and I restarted it, it would just go to the last it's a bit like a biz top persistence point I guess is the equivalent it would go over to the last index I'd read to and then keep continuing so if we have a 
quick look at this um, this in action. So pretty str pretty simple, straightforward thing. Um, the receiver console app you can see register an event processor here. So that's going to take a, a few seconds for it to actually come online because it's doing this creation behind the scenes of the of the um, event hub. And, and what you'll notice here is um, straight away we received some messages, which is um, not, a, not a demo gremlin, that's me forgetting to clean it out from the last time I did the demo. So a couple of weeks back I did a user group um, session where we showed this and I think on that event hub I, I obviously have the retention period set for, you know, that it hasn't expired yet. So I've still got some old messages on there waiting to be processed. So that kind of shows it, the, I guess, the replay support. But if we send a new message now, we start sending a couple, you'll see these starting to come through. And again, this is pretty quick. Um, you know, publishing those messages out is, is pretty easy. So hopefully that illustrates that um, event hubs is a nice, you know, to do a hello world type scenario anyway. It's a nice, easy thing to get up and running with. So if you wanted to try that out, it, it shouldn't be too difficult to do it. There's design choice wise. I mean, you've got to think about things like um, you know, if we go back to that slide, a few slides back. Um, you know, you'd, you'd really be wanting to think about things like how many partitions do I want, how many consumer groups. So you can only really have a you know a single set of um, processors listening on a consumer group. So you, you would um, you know you'd probably have like if you were doing a stream analytics job, you'd probably give that its own consumer group. You'd give another job its own consumer group and maybe your own custom application. Um, what I wanted to show next was a, a little bit of a kind of demo of just, you know, I mentioned for the university we'd been playing around with this idea of putting our um, putting our events up onto the event hub and then kind of deciding what to do with them later. So we haven't really finished this BI piece yet, but what I wanted to show you guys was just a bit of fun that we had where um, we wanted to kind of just get a feel for how the applications were looking and, you know, the I mean, this, sorry, I'm just starting this up here, so it's nothing more than for a bit of fun, but we created this naughty little console that we called the Matrix, and this, um, so at the minute, this is going to be receiving telemetry data from all of the university systems as they process, so you can see, as a user is doing something on the system, you'll see little bursts of activity from the, the log events getting logged from various components. So we, I think I mentioned we call this the Matrix as a bit of a joke, but it kind of just, when we you know, when you're kind of keeping an eye on the systems, what's going on, it just gives us a bit of a feel that it's alive and you can see, you know, user activity coming through. And it, it was really interesting to see that actually we didn't just have this constant stream of noise going on. It was just bursts here and there. And, you know, it, I mean, obviously at the minute there's there's not going to be many people on the systems, but that just gives you a feel of, you know, what we were thinking about doing with that, with that event um, telemetry data from the applications. And I guess um, architecturally, um, you know, we'll, we'll feed this into, into Power BI one way or another. It just may go through a, a few hoops to get there to, to aggregate that data a bit better. Okay, um, so jumping back to the slides then. Um, so I guess, um, where are we? So this, this was... Um, some of you might have seen this before, so the, this touched back on Paul's earlier question about costs. So Dan, um, Dan did this demo with the service bus team where they had um, the challenge of processing a billion events in a day, and what you know, how would they do it? What would it cost? What's involved? So, so the demo that they did was um, 12 throughput units on Event Hub, 12,000 messages a second. Um, you, know, you can see the stats on the screen there, but it was in public as well on, on Service Bus. So their um, their total cost for processing a billion messages in a day was $37, $37.66. So that gives you a, a kind of rough idea of, you know, a billion messages in a day for $40 as, as peanuts, whereas if you compared that to an on-premise implementation of whether it be, you know, MSMQ probably couldn't do it. If you did a RabbitMQ instance, you'd probably need something absolutely colossal that you'd spend more time 
you know, talking about your first design meeting about what your what your architecture and infrastructure needed to look like, whereas on service bus you've got your namespace up and running in about four clicks. So, you know, just, just some ideas there, but if we think about the other costs, um, you know, relay we're talking about six pounds sixty for ten thousand listening hours. Um, six pound twenty for ten million messages, so it gives it gives you some ballpark there. Service bus messaging we're talking about six pound twenty for twelve point five million operations per month and then it the, the costs just increment after that. Um, event hubs again hundred million messages is about pound seventy two and then about fourteen pound per month per throughput unit. So gives you you know gives you some ballparks but to put that in real term perspective is back when when I worked at Booba, um, we were running service bus relay for dev test production with about six test environments supporting dynamic CRM integrating into various line of business apps. And I think we in a year we hadn't spent hundred pound on service bus. Um, recently at the university we did a performance test exercise where we were repeatedly running performance tests up to about, I think if I remember right, it was about 4,000 users um, testing some of our website stuff. All of that traffic was, you know, going through service bus. I don't have a figure of exactly how many messages we processed, but we were hitting it pretty hard with a lot of um, a lot of messaging, and I think we spent about three pound in a weekend, something like that. It was it was you know crazy cheap. I mean, certainly it was in the space of you'd spend more money having a meet, one meeting about it than you would in the whole year. That, that was the kind of cost, but obviously other projects might be much bigger and, and might cost more than that. But hopefully, you know, with, with service bus, um, I guess to me particularly really in messaging, it's all about we can get a project up and running really cheaply, prove whether it actually works, and then we can decide then whether we go to a different architecture with a VPN or some alternative or we can just take that forward because it's reliable enough to take the production without thinking twice about it. Okay, so I'm just going to have a quick chat of the questions before I jump in. Um, so can Event Hub be compared with BAM? Um, yes and no. So I guess um, for Neelish, um, what we're trying to do with Event Hub is use that as a way of feeding telemetry data into a BI solution. So the end result is we want a BAM type experience, but we're, we're just getting the data there in a different way and we won't have the ugly BAM portal that you get with BizTalk, but our end result is a BI experience across the integration platform that covers BizTalk and other things. Um, is there a list of out-of-the-box applications supporting Service Bus? Um, I think, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll feed that back because I think that will be a really a really good question of feedback. I know um, Dynamics CRM definitely supports out of the box publishing to um, out of the box publishing to Service Bus queues, and I think we had a, an old video which I'll see if we can maybe share on Twitter where um, Colin Mead talked about some scenarios with Service Bus and Dynamics CRM. Uh, so Paul Summers, um, yeah, great question there. So I think. Um, for Service Bus, there's a whole bunch of um, documentation about different platforms talking to it. So I think um, I noticed Paolo was on the call earlier as well. So I think he's done quite a lot of stuff about devices talking to it for things like AMQP. Now, I think the, the main protocol Service Bus are targeting is the AMQP protocol, and there's support in many libraries for different formats of talking from Java and stuff. Um, I think I've seen examples for most things, but I'm not sure I've seen an example for Apple. Um, but we can, I guess, um, if, if that becomes a real thing that you need more info on, I guess the best thing we can do is point you to Dan, and Dan will know. Um, if he doesn't know the answer, he'll know who to who, who keep up with Microsoft about that. Um, right, so you can natively plug in the Event Hub in the Stream Analytics, yep. You're dead right there, Dan. Um, okay, so BizTalk plus Service Bus. Then. So what I wanted to do was um, kind of give give you guys a bit more than what was at my previous user group session because we've got a quite big BizTalk slant here where 
previously it was all people who weren't really best top guys, they were, they were just more sort of Azure people. Um, what I wanted to share was just some thinking about um, how you might combine the two, what the benefits might be. Um, I've got a little bit of a demo later on that I hope will, you know, it's not a very complex demo, but I hope it'll make people think a little bit about some of the opportunities that might be there. Um, so support for service bus out of biz talk. Um, my honest statement would be I'd love it to be better. Um, it, it works, it works pretty well, but I think to me I'd really like it if there was a, a completely seamless experience between service bus and biz talk and strategically they were very closely aligned. So an example of why I think they're not quite where I'd like them to be is that I think the the SB message and adapter is still on like, or at last to check it was on V1.8 of the um, service bus SDK or V2 or something like that. It's, a, it's not up to the latest version and I'd love those to be very closely aligned. But that said, the service bus message and adapter does support all of the key features for relay and messaging. So you can connect to a relay and listen on service bus or you can send to a relay. Likewise, you can connect to a queue or you can send to a queue. One bit you can't do out of the box is you can't talk to an event hub. Um, I'd love to see that in the next version of BizTalk. Um, my wish list would also include an AMQP adapter, which I think would be a better way of talking to service bus messaging than, than the SB messaging protocol because service bus is strategically aligned to AMQP and I think that AMQP adapter would support other non-Microsoft service bus type uh, products. So that, that would be my my wish list. Now, if we think of um, some of the user usage scenarios, let's go through a few examples of how you might combine BizTalk and Relay. And, and I know a few people on the call that I've, um, I've, I've spoken to in the past have done some of these scenarios. So that I think pretty much everything in here is, has been tried by at least one person or another. Um, first one would be, imagine you've got BizTalk hosted in a, as a VM in Azure and you need to talk to an on-prem web service. So I think um, many people saw my hybrid connectivity options um, session that I did on Integration Monday, uh, like much earlier in the year, and I did it at um, Integrate 2014. So one of the ways you could do this, and probably the simplest and cheapest to get up and running would be using the SB messaging um, adapter in BizTalk to listen to, uh, sorry, to send a message to Relay and that could then talk through to an on-premise WCF service. Now, whether you can connect that service directly to the relay depends on whether you can you can change the binding. But if you can't, one of your options could be to use the WCF routing service, like I did in the demo earlier. But this would be a really you know easy way to to test that whole connectivity piece to see whether you can get data out of that system before you made a final decision about whether you'd stick with Relay, consider Express Route of VPN or something like that. Um, it, it, you know, quick, quick and easy to do. Another option might be um, if you've got BizTalk on premise and you've got a partner or your own company's developing a SaaS application, uh, sorry, buying a SaaS application or developing an app in the cloud and you want to talk through to a BizTalk server on premise, one way you could do that would be to have a service bus relay endpoint. Now, if it's a custom dev application, then it's probably very easy for you to be able to talk to service bus relay and have BizTalk just be the listener on that relay. If it's a SaaS application, you might want to put a like a bridge component in the middle. So just to show what that would look like, what you might do is put um, something like an, a REST API that's easy for the SaaS component to call here, and that would um, save it having to use the, the kind of server, uh, the WCF relay bindings if it, if it couldn't do that. The key thing is the relay offers a really easy way for you to expose a BizTalk endpoint externally from your organization. The next one would be with relay is if, um, if you have BizTalk in company A, BizTalk and company B, and they want to talk to each other, but you don't want to necessarily do all the, the infrastructure piece to support that. One way you could do it would be to have them both um, expose endpoints with a receive adapter that listens on service bus relay, and then they could send messages to each other going through the relay, and 
you know, you, you can set that up pretty quickly without having to do a lot of infrastructure work to support that. So let's consider BizTalk plus Service Plus Messenger now. Um, imagine you've got um, something like an orders application, and one of the things you might be doing is um, I might be receiving a lot of orders or a lot in my web application in the cloud, and I've got my BizTalk on prem. And one of the challenges could be, well, how do I get my messages from the cloud to on prem? But another challenge might be, how do I level that load if I'm receiving you know, say I've got um, Black Friday and I'm receiving thousands of orders, um, maybe that's too many for my biz talk to be able to comfortably deal with in terms of receiving. So rather than send messages over HTTP or something like that to biz talk, instead what you might do is have the, the web app in Azure could just write those messages to a queue in the cloud and then biz talk could pull those messages down at a manageable level, you know, maybe, maybe doing like batching them in some way and you know get them into BizTalk and you can process them downstream but BizTalk wouldn't be taking the, the significant hit of the load from from the uh, web application. The next option might be if you wanted to publish some messages in a pub sub fashion so perhaps we've got BizTalk on-prem and we want to publish an event out to various receivers and we might not even know who the receivers are, but one of the things I could do would be push it to a queue, and then maybe Dynamics will subscribe to one queue, and maybe I'll have a logic app that um, that receives from the other queue, does something with an API app or something like that would be quite an interesting pattern. So BizTalk has the benefit that it doesn't need to talk directly to all these applications. It maybe wants to leave the messages somewhere for those applications to collect uh, to collect later on. And I think somebody kind of touched on this a bit earlier about the the, the different um, patterns here, but one of the key things that's different between Service Bus and BizTalk is that Service Bus is really a pull-based mechanism for receiving a message. So you put a message on a queue, it's durable, somebody's going to come and collect that, whereas BizTalk as a, as a pattern is going to push that message to an application. And BizTalk doesn't really support a pull pattern, Service Bus doesn't really support a push pattern, so combining the two together is a good way to get both. So the one that um, I wanted to do a little bit of a demo on and that I found quite interesting was um, if you um, if you think, um, sorry, I've spotted a question that's probably a good one to do now. Um, so I guess, um, Enat, so you're saying all those services sent in parallel um, which I assume means is these two these two arrows over here do they happen in parallel so the answer is it depends um, if so the, the key thing is the message is pushed to the key uh, to the topic the topic gives a copy of the message for each of these subscribers but the subscribers can either get them at the same time or one may get it now one may get it later or both may get it later it, it's really up to the receiver at that point BizTalk's not not waiting around to, to care whether they pick their message up to date tomorrow or whenever. Okay, so the the other the other one I was thinking about was um, I've talked to a few people over the last year about complexity of BizTalk solutions, and one of the things that can make BizTalk quite painful is when we've got shared artifacts. So if you take two BizTalk applications that have the same message based on the same schema and it's in a shared a shared BizTalk application maybe. The problem is if we go to if we want to undeploy that shared resource and patch a new version or we want to just add a side by side updated version, the dependency management between those all those applications is what makes BizTalk painful in terms of automated deployment and you know and that kind of thing. And in addition to that, when you um, another sort of complex challenge we have is if I want to update a BizTalk application, sometimes I can't undeploy it because that would remove my subscriptions, which means if I update this application and remove it, I might lose some messages that I want to, you know, when I, I won't start getting until the subscription's recreated after deployment. So that, um, that's kind of the root thing that causes quite a lot of pain in BizTalk implementations. And we end up, you know, kind of either just dealing with it and having over complexity 
or we end up um, working around it in some really convoluted way. Now, what I wanted to show was a bit of a demo um, on, my, on my other VM here. So the idea would be, well, if I combine BizTalk plus Service Bus, I can send messages out there and have them received by another BizTalk application. Now, what I'm doing there is I'm kind of moving some of the some of the message routing and some of the durability away from the message box and out on the service bus. And typical um, a typical BizTalk person might think about that and go, well, actually, that's kind of not the BizTalk way of doing it. And maybe maybe that's true. Maybe it was true once upon a time, and maybe isn't so much now. But what I want to show is really just what it offers you, and then at least people have got that in their arsenal as a design pattern, which might solve a few problems. And what I'm going to do with this as well is I'm also going to combine this with JSON because one of the benefits of sending a message from one application to another is if I convert it to JSON when I do it, it actually now loses its its um, binding to an XML schema. So I'm going to just show you what what I mean by this and, and see what people think. So I've got um, three BizTalk applications up here. I've got App 1, App 2, and App 3. And these three applications basically all have, let's see if I can show in App 3, they all have this um, Hello World schema in it, um, which is nothing fancy. It's just got a customer name in. But the only difference is that the target namespace one has app one, one has app two, one has app three. So basically, each application has its own copy of this this message, and I don't have a shared message that they all share. Now, what I've done is, in application one's going to be the sender, so he's going to receive a message from the file system that you can see here, and that's going to route through to a send port that's going to send it to service bus, and with Service Bus, I'm going to use this JSON decoder, sorry, JSON encoder, to convert the message to JSON before I send it. Other than that, it's pretty pretty simple SB messaging adapter. So I've just got my um, got my namespace. I've got a topic that I'm going to send it to. So I'll show you that in a second. I've got my shared access secret for sending the message. When I um, when I get the message in Service Bus, then what's going to happen is it's going to hit this topic and I've got two subscriptions which both have the default rule of a one equals one. Each of these top, uh, each of these subscription uses the forward to, so the subscription for app two is going to forward to a queue over here called to app two. And likewise, the subscription for app three is going to forward to the top, uh, to the queue for two app three. Now, just a bit of a, bit of a real world um, consideration here. One of the things I tend to do is um, I tend not to have my um, receivers listen to subscriptions. I tend to have them to listen to queues instead. So the reason for that is um, it may have changed more recently, but I don't think it has. But you didn't used to be able to create a, um, an authorization rule at a subscription level. So I'll just check whether that's... If you see here, there's, there's no way you can say only this this credential can listen to this subscription. At the topic level, you can specify who can you know who can send and receive on a topic. But if I've got multiple receivers, that means they can listen to each other's subscriptions, which I don't want. So what I do is I have the sender can send to a topic, but if you use forward to, it gives the option in the real world the limit who can receive on each individual queue, which I think is quite an important thing to think about. But anyway, the so the key thing is here, a message is going to be sent by application one to the topic, and both queues will get a copy of that message, one for each um, each receiving BizTalk app. So if we jump back to the, the VM here, so in app two, I'll just show app two because it's the same as app, app three. Um, let's not, not waste too much time. But app two is going to receive a message um, Nothing special about the service bus adapter, but in the receive pipeline, I can use this JSON decoder and I can say, right, your root namespace is the app to hello world and the root node is, is root. So that lets me take that JSON that was based off a schema originally in application one, 
was in XML format but converted to JSON as it went out of the queue. So I've reduced the message size on the queue, which is a good thing to do in Service Bus. Receive the message back, converting it back to XML, but I'm going to give it a different namespace now. And what that means is that I can then process this message in application two without having any reference or any dependency on application one. And then all I'm going to do here is my send port's going to just write it out to disk so that um, in app one, I'm going to, going to drop a message in. Sorry, let's stop being a fool here. So I'm going to drop a message in and it should come out in both folders but with different namespaces. So if I, if I show you this inbound message, you can see it's app one here. And um, we drop it in, hopefully a second later we've got two came out. And you can see we've got app three in the app three folder and app two in the app two folder. Now just to show um, just to show the, the JSON format of that message. So if I change, um, say, up to sorry, receive side. Um, So, just to show the JSON side of it, so if we change it back to pass through, you'd see it just came out as, as raw JSON instead. But the key thing is when um, when the rest, the encoder and the decoder work with this JSON format, it allows us to convert it from the XML in one app to the other, and we're able to now flow messages between BizTalk applications without having that dependency on a shared schema, which makes our deployments really complicated. Also by um, by having the messages on the queue in service bus, it means I could totally remove application two, do a new deployment of it, turn it back on, and then it would just process any messages that had been waiting on the queue in the meantime. And I think, you know, for, for many BizTalk um, implementations, that offers quite a lot or, or solves quite a lot of problems. Um, I guess one of the one of the bits, if you were interested in looking at that, was um, when you receive and you need to probably split different types of messages to different queues because that um, that pipeline, so I've got my own pipeline but I've dropped in the JSON decoder, you can only really specify one message type here so unless you want to write your own customized version of it or something like that, you'd, you'd probably want to have a different receive port for a different queue and pop different messages on each queue which is probably something you could do if you think about what I mentioned about half an hour ago about um, the sort of communicating what is the type of the message as maybe the label on the message, something like that. Um, so we, uh, I'll just finish up the last few slides um, and then go through the questions. So done the demo. So Event Hub, as I say, Event Hub, I think will be down the line, I think could be quite a cool one for BizTalk, but at the minute, there's there's limited stuff you can do with it. So, one of the options might be if you're um, if you're doing um, Internet of Things stuff and you're hitting an event hub, what you could do would be use event processor host like I showed in the demo earlier, and then forward messages onto BizTalk. So, one option might be to write um, use event ho uh, processor host as an out of pro uh, an isolated BizTalk host while there's no adapter for this, so that would be quite interesting. Um, I, I think that would be quite a cool pattern, to be honest. Um, and certainly, you know, as long as you're happy that the number of messages you, you're going to get in isn't going to flood BizTalk and give you lots of problems, but I think that's definitely one to explore. Um, the, the kind of BizTalk specific part of the telemetry use case I talked about earlier, this idea that I flow a message into BizTalk so as it comes in here in the receive pipeline, I've got my telemetry from a pipeline going out to Event Hub. I might have some logging from my orchestrations going out, and I might have my outbound pipelines going out. And then from the Event Hub, I can kind of do whatever I want with it. So maybe I hook in Power BI, Stream Analytics, Cortana, you know, whatever it is that's going to make BAM look look better than it does now in BizTalk, I guess is the key thing. 
Um, so more information then um, before I jump into the questions. So Dan's session about top service bus features you didn't know about is on that link. My connectivity options integration Monday is on, you know, from ages ago is on that link as well. Um, I've got an article about event hubs versus messaging, which, um, which a lot of people have, have given me some really nice feedback for. So that might be a good place to go and look if you're not sure about one versus the other. Um, I hope everybody's found this pretty interesting. Um, I was a little bit conscious that it might be a little bit naughty, but it seems to have come across really well from the, the comments I'm getting. So I'm just going to jump into the questions now. Um, so I'll drag these out. Um, so I'll jump back up a little bit and just review what we've got. Um, so Magic's question earlier, what is big scale for Azure SB messaging? We need to be able to support connections to two, three million devices in an IoT way, possibly bi-directional. Um, I would say so in terms of service bus messaging, when you go to really big scale, this, this forward to um, idea is a really good way of like sharding out the, the messages themselves. So often what you might do is um, you might send to a topic and then use forward to to show it out to another topic and then and then just keep building out this big tree so the the idea is um, and you could do that with multiple receiving topics as well so I think there is some some limits on um, how many um, how many senders and receivers you can have on given given entities now I can't remember off the top of my head what they are but you can scale those out um, by sending to different ones and receiving from different ones that can let you go to bigger scale but Generally, if it's an IoT thing, I think for telemetry patterns, to me, um, Event Hubs is the real obvious candidate nowadays. So some of the use case um, examples, uh, the case study examples earlier, they were probably done before Event Hubs was available because the you know things like the connected car and the um, the other one about the building sound more like Event Hub patterns to me than messaging. For bi-directional, I think you probably more of a, um, a messaging space, so maybe we can have a chat offline, Magic, if, you, if you've got a bit more info about that, um, and I'll, I'll see if I can give you some more specific pointers, but I think um, as a general rule for IoT patterns, you probably want to start with event hubs. Um, so we've covered the BAM one already, uh, we've covered the out-of-the-box stuff, um, I think we've covered Paul's question. Um, So I think Magic will we'll take that one offline if that's all right. Um, covered that in parallel. Very clever was Dan's comment. I'm, I'm assuming that hopefully that was about me, but I'll, I'll see. Um, is there a way to get around message size limit? So I think the message size limit is about um, service bus has a message size limit of 250K, I think it is, something like that. So I think um, there's a couple of things you can do. and and I think um, one thing might one thing that might be a good um, good suggestion would be um, checking out Dan's session in a, in a few weeks' time because hopefully he'll talk about that a little bit more there. But right now, if you're dealing with message size limits, there's a few options. So number one, you can you can um, compress messages when you put them on queues and and take them off. So that's something I've done quite a bit. Um, by one of the things about converting it to JSON before I put it on the queue. That's a good way of, of getting, you know, reducing that message packet size quite significantly. So I think um, if anyone read the white paper I wrote um, quite a while ago, it was actually a, um, a paper on BizTalk 360, which was about um, the REST adapter. And one of the themes I tried to get in there was this idea that um, JSON's not just about REST. JSON's about, you know, data format and, and we can use it with a number of different protocols so to me anytime you're doing service bus stuff you really want to try and do JSON because of the, the size benefits but then um, in addition to that Dan I've also got an article on my blog about how to deal with um, large messages in service bus so you've got the option of doing a session where you can send a, a bunch of messages and say these messages are related so you can you can kind of break a big object up, send it in a series of related messages and receive it and put it back together later. And that can help with some patterns, but with other patterns, 
and I guess there's some constraints around what you can do with that. Um, the other options you can maybe do something like cash aside. So one of the patterns I've done would, which you could probably do with BizTalk, is that you'd send a, the message going through Service Bus would be a pointer to the actual message, which you may choose to store in blob storage or in a NoSQL database of some kind. And the message on Service Bus would be really small because it just it's a reference to a message held elsewhere. Um, but hopefully that article will um, cover all of your all of your um, questions on that. Um, I'm sure you've seen it, but give me a shout if, you, if you've not come across it. Uh, Paul Summers, that's exactly what I was looking for, so I'm, I'm hoping that that's a thumbs up on the session, Paul. Um, thank you for that. Um, what are the advantages to send in JSON? So, Enat, um, JSON, in my opinion, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages. So, the, the key advantage is that um, it, it's um, going to be a smaller size for the message because you, you're going to get rid of start and end tags, you get rid of the you know the um, greater than less than signs. Um, so it can have in a lot of messages that can have a really big difference in the overall message size. Um, the the other I guess one of the disadvantages and well let, let's take advantages first. One of the other advantages is that the cool kids all really like you because they all like JSON. One of the disadvantages in my opinion is that the message isn't self describing. So again, I'll, I'll call out that paper I wrote on BizTalk 360 where I kind of went through all of that sort of stuff. But to me, I like to be able to take a message and in its own right, I can look at it and it tells me what it is. And that means that if I go and give you that message, you can work out what to do with it because it's self-describing. But with Jason, it, because he, you know, the, the kind of the concept of schema kind of exists, but it's not as mature. And this idea of being able to have a self-describing message, I think, is a bit more, a bit more um, immature. So if you take um, a look at that, um, be, if we take a look at that message I had before on the BizTalk server, um, so look at that one there. So we've we've got just root as the root element. So and and to be honest, that this bit here doesn't necessarily need to exist either. That that and what was there previously is the same message. So if you get that, the question is, what what the hell is it? You know, is it a customer message? Is it a customer update message? Is it something else? And so to me, um, with Service Bus, that's why it's important that if, especially if you use JSON, you use the properties of the message to tell you what the message is, so you know how to be sure what you're going to do with it. Um, but the, those are the the key things, I guess. I mean, JSON's much more strategically, um, you know, XML's been around for years and most apps support it. JSON's been around for years but not quite as long um, and, and more applications are strategically looking to use that format. So I think as integration people we need to use both. Um, you mentioned that topics are good for PubSub but not designed really for push scenarios. What might be a way to still drive a push of a message in a queue either on a schedule or the event that received the message. Want to use this for flexible pub sub where subscriber can choose how to receive the message. Okay, great. That's a really great question, Don. Um, so the key thing here is that um, pull basically means the message is on a queue. Something comes and gets the message. Push means I've got you know like a biz talk send port. I've got a message and I'm going to call you over something like HTTP to a passive endpoint you expose for me. So the idea here is that if you if your application, you know, the problem is most applications don't support pull. Um, most of the ones I've come across that do support pull tend to be around like GMS or something like that. I haven't seen many applications that support pull for MSMQ or Service Bus or many of the other, you know, RabbitMQ. It's often there's some intermediary that gets the message from the queue pushes it to your passive application. And I think um, if I can be probably slightly controversial in an in integration space, I think um, the reason that happens quite a lot is it's an opportunity for an application vendor to be able to go, we're not responsible for um, collecting our messages and processing them. We just we offer you an interface and you can give them to us. But if you know we, we just support a nice clean API that you can call but 
we're not going to take care of the problem of plugging into the queuing system. And I think historically some of that comes because there wasn't EMQP for a long time. Um, if you if you want to do convert you know conversion of push to uh, pull to push is a very common integration pattern. So if you're doing it in the service bus space, um, you've got a couple of options. So one, you can do some kind of custom coded solution. Um, two, you can use something like N Service Bus or one of the messaging frameworks. Three, you could use BizTalk, so you can have BizTalk receives from a queue and pushes to something over WCF or REST or something else. Um, and I think um, four would be you could maybe use something like a logic app that um, would pull from a service bus queue, do something with a message, and then and then send it somewhere. And I think with this idea of conversion from push to pull, normally it's more than just the conversion. It's normally pull the message from the queue, convert it to a different format, call an API, and then delete the message from the queue when you're done. And you know, there's there's quite a bit to that, and um, so I think you know, well, give me give me a shout if you'd like to chat about that that a bit more. Hope, hope that helps. Um, so cheers, Paul. Thanks for the good feedback, matey. Um, Magic again. Event hubs is what I'll explore more. Thanks for the answer. Awesome. Um, uh, message size. Yep. So Paul confirming what I was thinking as well there. Um, Windows Server supports greater than two five six. But obviously that'll come from managing the platform. Yep, dead on, Dan. I mean, uh, sorry, Stan. So what are the options if you want bigger message sizes? Is that you can um, you could install your own Windows Server service bus and you know manage, kind of manage that yourself. Now, I guess the the history to that was that um, if Microsoft offer an unlimited message size, then it becomes very difficult for them to support an SLA that would support all customers. So I think with um, the idea being with 256K as a message size, it means they can support um, you know thousands of customers to a certain SLA that that's you know common for everybody. Um, increasing that message size risks that SLA, so I think that's why they've they've kind of had it as is. But if you support, if you use your own service bus server, you can set that up and you accept a, a different level of management. So. Microsoft might manage your VMs if you deploy it to Azure, but you'd have to manage Service Bus and SQL, and then you would be able to do bigger messages. Um, so that's definitely one approach as well. I mean, to, to be honest with you, I've kind of um, stayed away from Service Bus Server a little bit because I think it, it just doesn't seem to be, excuse me, evolving as quickly as Azure. And I think um, I've never had a customer who really wanted to manage that themselves, but it's definitely an option if people want to do that. Um, I'm just gonna. I think that's the end of the questions on go to webinar. So I'm gonna quickly check the other sources. Um, so let me bear with me for a minute. Um, so I don't think we've got anything on the discussion forum. Um, on the On Twitter, so we've just got um, a few confirmations there. So I think um, if that's the end of the questions, um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, I think you all seem to like that, so I'm really pleased with that, which is really cool. Um, next week we've got Tommaso, so um, I hope everyone can make it for that session, which is a, an API app session. And um, yeah, cheers, everyone, and take care.